most important idea I've ever had is the idea that I'm going to be successful. The goal is to do better today than you did yesterday. In 2004, a record label employee with maverick ambitions had an idea. Brooklyn native Stephen Victor had cut his teeth as a publicist at Interscope and saw an opportunity to reimagine the role of a music executive. Fortunately, Victor was just a few degrees away from one of the most exciting rap groups on earth, and thanks to his resourcefulness, plus a string of W's, before long he found himself managing the clips. From there, he would launch Pusha T's solo career, lead Kanye West's good music, and break artists like Designer and Pop Smoke as well as founding his own label, Victor Victor Worldwide. And it all started with one idea. We grew up in like a, a two family house, but it was like me, my sister, my parents, my father's like brother's family, his sister's family. Did you know growing up what you wanted to do? And at one point I wanted to be a lawyer. Another point I wanted to be a, like a car designer. I went to school in Brooklyn for elementary school and for the first year of high school, and then I went to Virginia for the, the last three years. When did the music industry become... An idea? Yeah. The year before I went to college, um, my, my best friend had an internship. I asked him, I was like, yo, what's this internship? It might have been Bad Boy, I don't know. He was describing to me what he was doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and I was like, that doesn't seem like it has anything to do with musical ability and he was like no nah, it doesn't so i was like you can work in a music business and not <laughs> have any talent and he was like yeah there's like managers there's a and r's there's marketing people and i was like hmm, interesting <laughs> once i realized okay you can work in the music industry and not be like a producer a rapper or a singer i started like researching like different careers in the music industry right and i was like oh i want to be a manager or i want to one day own a record label when I went to college, my roommate's dad had a record label. This is Hawk uh, Islam? Yeah. So I was like, yo, get me an internship with your dad. And he was like, okay, cool. What ended up happening is that I bumped into, you know, Junior. Junior was, Surreal. Yes. Is, he was a, a publicist at Interscope. At Interscope. At I see a bunch of activity going in and out of this guy's office. So I walk into his office and I'm like, yo, what do you do? So he tells me. And I'm like, I want to intern for this guy. He's like, he got a bunch of action going on. <laughs> so I was like, yo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna graduate. Um, let me intern for you when I graduate. And he was like, sure. Here's my info, just call me when you graduate. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna take this really seriously because if, I, if I'm able to interact with all these different departments and all these different areas um, of the business, like that's just information and knowledge that I could take so that one day when I become a manager or an A&R or a label executive, like I'll have that experience. I think the music business in general is just like so exciting right now. Like, and there's no barriers to entry, right? So there's no excuses. Like if you're an artist and you want to make art and be an artist, like you have no excuses. You could do a bunch of things without a record label, without a manager, without a publishing company. You could do so many things to get your shit off the ground. How long did you end up interning for almost free? I don't know, maybe three years, two and a half years. And you're living at home? Yeah, I was living at home, yeah. Was there any point where you were questioning the amount of time and energy you were investing into this? No, <laughs> not once. Junior, you know, his personality was one where he was kind of just like, oh, you want to learn about that? Cool, go ahead. It wasn't, he didn't block anything off. Whatever I asked him, he was just like, oh, cool. You want to do this? You want to do that? Whatever you want to do, like, go ahead. <laughs> So right. you're starting to, to deal with artists and... Yeah, I started dealing with artists like really quickly. Covering photo shoots, dealing with like their managers. I was basically like Junior's assistant, so, and he had a lot going on, so... What artist was he repping? At the time it was like uh, Jadakiss, Styles, Eve. There was a group called City High that he was yeah. working with. Common. You very quickly made a connection with Chris Smith and Nelly Furtado. I was going down to the VMAs with Jada and Slim. And then I just remember they were like, oh, Nelly's gonna be there. 
he could just work with her, you know what I'm saying? I was responsible for working her down the red carpet. I went to go meet with Nelly's manager, Chris. He's like, so what's your plan? I'm like, looking at him I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, plan? What do you mean what's my plan? He's like, okay, I see you don't have a plan. Let's meet up again in a couple hours. So what did you do? I think I went back to my room and I called Junior and I was like, yo, I told him what happened. And he was like, okay, so put together a plan and, and take it back to him. I'm like, yo, what is this guy talking about? What plan? Like, I'm gonna walk her down the red carpet and that's that. And he was like, yeah, sure, but if this guy's asking you for a plan, like, put it together. Tell him who you're gonna put her in front of and why and present it to him. He obviously is looking to be, to be um, a little more professional than he used to being, so. So I, I put together a plan, I, I went and met with him, and he was like, this is great. <laughs> I really like you. You know, because I'm, I'm, I'm used to working within hip hop, which is like, it's like a certain way. Yeah. Right? A lot of things are late, you know, people are just kind of doing what they want to do. Whereas with Chris, he was kind of, he looked at the business, or he treated the business, from my vantage point at least, um, as a business. So like, everything was very organized, structured, and like, deliberate. So how did you go from that to working with the clips? A friend of mine, Nicole, she used to work for Star Trek. Nicole Planton? Yeah. I went down to Nicole's office and I was like, yo, you need to get me a, a meeting with Pharrell. And she was like, for what? <laughs> I was like, I want to work with the clips. She was like, okay, well, I, I can't get you a meeting with Pharrell, but I can get you on the phone with Pusha. I was like, okay, cool. And then he, he called me, I think the, the next day. And I was like, yo, I was talking to Nicole. I'm a huge fan. Um, this is what I think I could do for you. What was that? You know, he was putting those mixtapes out and mm -hmm. I was like, yo, this like, this shit's like really good, but you know, nobody knows about it. I was like, this is what I've been able to do for these artists. I could do the same thing for you and I, I'll, I'll do it for free. Like, just give me a, a, a shot and I'll show you what I can do. And then if you like it, you know, we could talk about maybe you paying me or figuring something out. So you were willing to pay it forward and just work for free, on yeah. the strength? For sure. In that early time, I mean, you know, obviously you and I became friends. You managed to make a lot of connections within the media circles in a more organic way than many publicists. Yeah. It didn't ever feel like, you know, when- I was pitching you shit, Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And you also knew when it was good and when it wasn't good. Yeah. I think I was just fortunate enough to, a lot of the stuff that I was working on, like I was a fan of. I don't think any of my success is luck or the product of my own invention because I'm not an inventor. But I do think that the majority of my success comes from opportunities that I've been given. You're working the second Clips album and are the guys happy with what you've been able to do for them? Yeah, from a press standpoint, they're like well, you static. Got, you got them the double XL. I got them double XL, I got them New York. I was just, you know, I was really good at my job. I had like two mentors, right? So there was Chris Smith, with Nelly, who mm -hmm. I learned a lot from him. And then there was Tony Draper with the Clips. He was managing the Clips at the time when I was doing their PR. Draper wasn't a manager, he owned the record label. Him and Pusha were friends, so Pusha asked him to manage him because okay. he knew so much about the business. So his perspective never came as a manager. It was as a label owner. With Draper, I was learning entrepreneur skills. Like he was like, always treat the label's money like it's your own money. You want to treat this like a business. You don't want to treat it like an ATM. And I'm like 26, 26. I'm like, no, you want to treat it like an ATM. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> he would always like be like, yo, you always have to read the fine print. You always have to structure your deals in a way that is beneficial to you on the back end, not the front end. Always forget about the front end. And I would be like, no, the front end, the front end. I wouldn't say this thing, but that's what I'd be thinking that's in my mind. Thing, yeah. I'm like, this guy is like nutty, you know? How did you make that transition from being the Clips publicist to being their manager? The same way I got the opportunity from Junior is the same way I got the opportunity from Pusha. Pusha was the one that called me one night and he was like, yo, I really like what you've been able to do with us from a press standpoint, plus, you know, the other things that you've been able to help us with. And I think it would be cool if you played a role in our... He wasn't like, can you be my manager? He was like, I think it would be cool if you played a role in management. So when he said that, did, did you think that this was going to be like a life-changing yeah. opportunity? For sure. And he was right. It would change his life, but not overnight and not without some immediate challenges. Shortly after Victor began managing the clips, the duo splintered with Malice trading his mic for a Bible, leaving brother and groupmate Pusha T to forge his own path. It gave Victor plenty of responsibility to shoulder, but his deft decisions allowed him to morph roadblocks into on-ramps, laying the foundation for the next phase of he and Pusha T's career. 
what are the things that you all of a sudden are now dealing with that you had never even I mean, considered? If I'm being honest, like I was, it was like fuck up after fuck up after fuck up, right? <laughs> being a manager is not just like picking phone calls and fielding calls and, you know, booking concerts. It's like, it's so many different things in between and beyond all of that. Fairly shortly after you start doing the, you know, complete 360 of the management, yeah. the group comes apart. Were you concerned? I mean, this is obviously no. your only client at the time. No? <laughs> what did you think was gonna happen? Push would go solo, he'd have success, and then they'd get together after, you know. <laughs> some amount of time? Yeah, some amount, exactly. What was your strategy towards building him as the solo artist? It was always like, what are we gonna do to elevate his career? Like that's how we approached every opportunity. It was never how much money is this or how much money is that. I wanna say that we're also fortunate, right? So, cause as this is happening, like Rick Ross called Pusha and was like, yo, I'm in Hawaii with Kanye. He wants you to come out to Hawaii and work on his album with him. This is like all happening all in real time. There's not much time to kind of like, okay, let's sit back and figure out what we're gonna do. It's like, as we're figuring it out, like opportunities are coming. There'd be periods where we would be in Hawaii and for like two or three weeks and you know, no work would be getting done. So for someone like Pushy, he's got like, you know, what is this? This doesn't make sense. But in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking as like these trips are going on, I'm thinking to myself how I think it's a good fit creatively. We were supposed to go out there one time and he was like, I'm not going, man. <laughs> he was like, this is, this is, this ain't it. And I was like, no, nah, we, we, we have to go. Like his process is his process. Like we're just, he's like, I'm not going. So you decide to get on the plane even without yeah. push. And I'm just, cause he's like, figure it out. I, I said, okay, I'm gonna go figure it out. <laughs> so I get on the plane without him. What happened? So I, I land, I go to sleep, I wake up and I realize that I forgot my toothbrush. So by this time it's like five o'clock in the morning. So I'm walking across the street and there's a car like flying down the road. And I'm like, yo, who's this? <laughs> and then I'm like, fuck, that looks like Kanye's car. And then the car like breaks and it starts reversing. I'm like, this can't, this, there's no way this is, this is this dude, right? Breaks up and he's like, oh, hey man, where you going? I'm like, back to my room. He's like, where's Pusha? And I'm like, oh man, he's on a flight. He's, he'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> and he's like, oh, why is he not here? We're like, it's a stomach virus. He'll be here tomorrow. And he was like, oh, cool. Uh, we're playing basketball. Like, you want to come? And I'm like, sure. He's like, all right, I'll pick you up at nine o'clock. So, I, you know, I get in the car and we go play basketball. And on the way back, like we're talking and he's like asking me questions about the clips and so on and so forth. And, and I'm like, yo, you know, we should do X, Y, Z. And he's like, it's a great idea. So, you know, I, I get back and I, I call Push and I'm like, yo, I just had this conversation with Kanye. You need to come out here ASAP so we can figure this out. You know, there was more to it because someone else was trying to sign Pusha. Were you taking that that other situation seriously? I was, but Pusha was taking it more seriously than I was. Okay. Because for me, I was like, okay, that makes sense financially. Like, it looks like a better situation financially, but creatively and like long term, I think this makes way more sense. We were operating as if we had a deal, even okay. though like other labels was trying to sign him because they knew he was no longer at Columbia. People started finding out he was in Hawaii working with Kanye and that he was gonna be on the album. People started calling, but we had already made the decision to work with Ye. I only invest my time in things that I'm interested in, not things that I think are gonna be successful. How quickly from there to actually getting the paperwork done and Oh, it might have been a year, but the intent and the idea was, okay, we're gonna do this. So he signs to good music. Yeah. You guys put out a couple well-received albums mm -hmm. and he ends up becoming the president of good music. Yeah. And you then become the head of A&R for yeah. good music. How did those conversations happen? Th those conversations started with Pusha and Kanye. Kanye to Pusha was, I really like how you think, I like your perspective, and I like your um, taste in music, and I want you to run the, the company. And Pusha was like, okay, great. Creatively, I can do that, but Steven can help with the business. In the beginning, it was like, we were all just figuring it out. And then when it became like, okay, let's start signing artists, then it was just like, I was thrown into it. 
the first artist that you guys signed was Designer. Yeah, so for example, with Designer, we were in LA and Kanye was playing his music back. He was playing Life of Pablo. Okay. And he played the record uh, Father Stretch Part 2, right? Yep. So at the time, Designer wasn't signed, but he was on the song. I remember I, I said to him, I was like, yo, is that Future? And he was like, no, it's not Future. Actually, he was like, yo, it's this kid from Brooklyn. You need to go find him. And I'm like, kid from Brooklyn? And he's like, yeah, Pat sent me this SoundCloud link. You need to go find this kid and we need to sign him. His lawyer is this guy named Bob Celestin. Yeah, I know him because he used to be the manager for City High. So I called him and I said, yo, you got this kid named Designer. I'm working for Kanye now and we want to sign him. And he was like, oh man, um, you're calling me like a week too late. We've already agreed on terms with um, so-and-so label. I said, set up a meeting with me, you, Designer and his manager. And he's like, all right, I'll set up the meeting. I got on a red eye to New York. We had a meeting on Saturday night. So designer's here, his manager's here. And Bob is just explaining it to me, like, yo, the deal is done, whatever, whatever. But he's like, designer, this is Steven Victor, blah, 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 blah. This is what's going on. But the deal is done. Designer's like, I want to hear what he has to say, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I, I give him my pitch and I'm like, yo, this is why you should sign to Kanye as opposed to... And what, what was your pitch? I was just like, listen, man, you got this song, it's blowing up, but it's Kanye. There's so much you can get, there's so much va added value you can get just from even working with him on a creative level, like the things you could learn, the access you could have. It's, you know, you should consider it. Designer was like, yo, I want to, I think I want to do this. I'm thinking about it like, okay, it's the weekend, so I have an advantage. That if you can get it locked in by Monday morning. By mon before Monday. All the other A&Rs and everybody else. Everything else is like, it doesn't matter. I go home and I call um, business affairs at Universal and I'm like, yo, Kanye wants to sign this kid and we need to get him a contract like before Monday. So I'm like, yo, we need to get designer to LA so they can work on this song. Bob is like, so how are we going to sign the contract? And I'm like, somebody will bring it to the airport. <laughs> Did they? Yeah, somebody brought it to the airport. He signed to LAX? <laughs> yeah. I'm not looking for success necessarily, right? So I don't, for me, there's no pressure, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm not looking for, like, a win. Yeah. I'm just looking to find a, a great artist. And whether that, whether that great artist ends up being someone that sells a million records, two million records, 30,000 records, and that might happen in six months, it might happen in a year, it might be 10 years from now. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> so the deal gets done, and you guys obviously have a very explosive two or three months yeah. immediately after that. Panda goes crazy, mm -hmm. Father Stretch yeah. becomes a classic. What are the most important things that you learn from watching Kanye work? Never let anything get in the way of creative. Like never take no for an answer. Always do things with pure intentions. How quickly from signing designer did you end up being invited into meetings with Lucien? It wasn't that fast. It was, it was kind of like designer happened then Kanye's album happened. The meetings with Lucian ended up happening because my contract with Good Music was expiring. So you sign for like a, a certain amount of years, anywhere from like one to three years. And then, you know, when the deal comes up, you, ha you either renegotiate and extend for more time or someone, another company comes and says, hey, we want you to come work for us. And my intention was always to continue working with Kanye. And then, you know, things happen. You get offered this, you get offered that. And you have to make a decision. Was that a difficult decision? Kanye's relationship is with Universal, right? So that's one thing. But then the other thing is when I, when I went to meet with Lucien, it was one of those moments where it's like, okay, this guy's like very inspiring. Tell me about that energy. That's what it is, it's, that, it's energy, right? And it's just like, okay, I think that not only is he gonna push me to be great, but just being around him is gonna make you want to do not do the impossible, but... It, it creates excellence and pushes you to... Exactly. So I'll give you an example. This is why yeah. I say that I don't do things for money, right? So when I was doing my deal with Universal, I had two other offers on the table, right? And one of them, their offer was twice the amount that Universal offered me. And what stopped you from signing that? I was like, I can have way more success and I'll be way more fulfilled working with this guy. Most of my inspiration comes from people, like different individuals that I'm inspired by and just being around those different people and seeing them work and seeing how 
their mind works, um, where their creativity comes from. While the decision to part ways with Kanye and good music wasn't an easy one, Victor knew that placing himself in a new environment would force him to grow. And that growth took multiple forms, from a failed tenure at Def Jam Recordings to ultimately a very successful one helming his own label where he would sign Pop Smoke, one of the biggest artists of the last few years. The deal that Lucian offers you, what, what did that look like? Lucian's perspective is, what are the things that you want to do? As opposed to like everyone else is like, we want you to do X, Y, Z for us. He was like, okay, you're interested in film and TV. We have an avenue where you could work. You want to do publishing, help songwriters, producers. We have that too. And you want to do traditional record label stuff. You could do that too. On top of that, it was like, and we'll give you an opportunity to create your own brand. And then how does Ski Mask? So Ski End Mask comes one. along because I have a friend named Make who calls me up one day and he's like, yo, I found this kid. I said, okay, cool, who's the artist? So he tells me his name and I'm like, how do you pronounce it? And he's like, XXX Tentacion. I'm like, okay, cool. I was like, send me the music. So he sends me the Look At Me song, right? Yep. So I'm in my car and I play it, but it comes on and it's just like, yeah, I'm like <laughs> so I hit him and I'm like, yo, I think you sent me the wrong song. Like, this <laughs> and he's like, nah, he's like, oh, let me check. And he calls me back. He's like, no, I, I sent you the right song. And I said, are you sure? And he's like, bro, I'm telling you, this kid is like hot. He's like, he's the next one. Just get on the phone with him, you know what I'm saying? Like, and he'll explain to you like his vision. And he's like, yo, he can only speak at this time. And I'm like, why? And he's like, oh, he's in jail. And I'm like, what's he in jail for? So he tells me what he's in jail for. And I'm like, okay. So I get on the phone with him and he's like, he's speaking like a hundred miles an hour. And he's like, yo, I'm a good person. Like I make this kind of music. I make rock, I make reggae, I make rap. So to me, I'm thinking, yo, this kid got to be like trolling me. I'm like this whole situation just sounds crazy. You know what I'm saying? He's in jail. That that one song that I heard is like yeah, I'm it's just, almost like punk rock. Yeah, and, but and then he's telling me he does like all genres. So I'm just like, bro, like I can't, I don't. So he's like, I right, cool. I got I got someone else for you. They're in a crew together, but he like he can really rap. And I meet with Ski, and he's like in my office, and he's rapping like all freestyles. And I'm not even familiar with like the SoundCloud world like that. I'm just like, yo, this kid could rap his ass off. And like, I need to sign him. When you look at like all of these different acts that you've been involved with, what creative decisions are you most proud of having had a hand in? I think convincing Pusha to rap on Yogi's beat that ended up being the theme song for Arby's. What? Yeah. <laughs> If you watch Arby's commercial, mm -hmm. at the end of it, it goes, Arby's, we are, we are the meats, duh, duh, duh. That's the song. That's the song. And they, but they don't even use Push's part. They don't even use Push's part, but they have to pay him because he, yeah. own, he owns 50% of the song. So every time they, they want to sync the, the song, they have to come to us for approval. After significant but modest successes, yeah. you're presented with an opportunity by Lucien to go run a and at Def Jam. How was that merchandised to you? Well, I had a conversation with Paul Rosenberg first. It kind of morphed into, I'm going into Def Jam and this is how I envision it. I'd like you to be a part of it. I say, okay, how do we achieve this vision that we're trying to achieve? So my thing is we bring people that are like really good at their jobs. So it was like, okay, we're gonna bring in Noah from Complex. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do all these different things to change the dynamic of the company. The tenure at Def Jam for, I think, all of us involved. Yeah, didn't work out so well. How do you feel about it now? How do I feel about it not working out? Yeah. I think I learned a lot. In my eyes, like, it was a, it was a failure, right? <laughs> the opposite of successful. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that experience for, like, anything. I feel like it's made me a better executive, a better, like, manager of people. I played a major role in the lack of success. I think that sometimes in life you have to like be cognizant of what's going on and how your actions are affecting like people around you, especially when you're like responsible for managing them or their livelihood. I just wanted to get to to where I'm trying to go without thinking about like the consequences. So how quickly into that scenario did you realize that this, this was is not, not it? This was not it, and it wasn't going to work. Sixty days into it, I was like, wait a minute. 
This does not feel right. You have to be okay with making mistakes and the consequences that come with those mistakes. I think what happens is sometimes people allow their mistakes to become like a disability. Like, oh shit, I took this job and I was essentially a failure at it, right? The way I look at it is that I was immature. You know, I handled this and that the wrong way. Oh, okay, cool. I won't do that again. Is there anything else that you can put your finger on that you feel like is a reason that all of these opportunities keep bubbling up and coming to you without the friction? I have this saying where it's like, always for love, never for money, right? So when I'm looking for certain opportunities, it's coming from like a genuine place. I'm not going towards this opportunity thinking, oh, I'm gonna benefit from this financially. I'm going into the opportunity like, I'm really interested in this and let me see where I can add value more than what can I extract from it. I'm trying to figure out how can I add to it. I'm obviously not doing things for money. <laughs> Coming up in the music industry when it wasn't doing so well, it's kind of like climbing up a slippery ladder, right? So if you're climbing up a slippery ladder, you're gonna fall like a bunch of times and you're gonna figure out how to like grip the ladder so you don't fall as many times until you get to the top. You extricate yourself from, from Def Jam yeah. and you go back now to the center mm -hmm. with Victor Victor, but you now have an artist that you're talking to. Yeah. Pop Smoke. Yeah. How did that relationship happen? That was from one of my A&Rs, Rico. He keeps pushing me, keeps pushing me, and he finally asked me to take the meeting. So I take the meeting, and I when I meet Pop, like, I'm like, yo, this kid's a superstar. I'm like, he's a superstar, and he's like, hella talented. And so I called Rico and I said, Yo, what's it gonna take to get this deal done? And I remember he told me, he said, this is what Pop is looking for. And I remember I was at home with my wife and I was like, there's this kid I really wanna sign, but his manager wants X, Y, Z. And I was like, that's like insane. He has like nothing going on. I remember my wife said to me, she said, it's either gonna be successful or it's not. So if you believe in him, you should give him what he wants. Because if he becomes successful, he's gonna remember that you took the chance on him. So I signed him and, you know, I was like, because you're talented and you know what you want, I was like, it's going to take you longer to get to where you're trying to go. And we have to take the long road as opposed to like shortcuts. In an era where so many A&R decisions get made based solely off data, what is it that you look for? I always look at the person, independent of their talent or any of that stuff. I look at the person and what drives them and like their perspective. And when did you start to feel like it, it was really beginning to catch? You know, when we did his first show in London, we put the tickets up for 200 people and it sold out in like three minutes. Oh wow. So then we bumped up the room to 500, sold out again. We bumped it up to 1,000, sold out again. How important is having the ability to build up like these relationships with artists? I think it's probably like the most important thing. Not just with artists, I think with just anyone. I think the relationships are like the most important. I've never signed a, an artist looking at data. Like, I don't even know how to read data. I don't even, you know, know what to look at to know if it makes sense or not. It either speaks to me or not. As all of this is happening, are you feeling any sort of sense of concern for his situation or the way that he's moving? He was understanding it and he was, you know, making the necessary steps, but it wasn't like a 360. It was kind of like a slow, gradual thing. Because his whole thing was, listen, I don't want to change who I am to be able to be successful, which okay. is why I reached out to 50. And 50 told 50 was like, yeah, you could absolutely be true to yourself and still have success. Like, I'm still 50. I sold 50 million records, you know what I'm saying? And like, I, I haven't changed. Once he saw 50 say that, I think it clicked. I've never had someone that close to me pass away. Not that sudden or it's not someone that I was speaking to like every single day, multiple times a day. Like how do you even as, as a person, you know, obviously the business stuff becomes completely unimportant, I would imagine in that yeah. moment. But how are you able to keep moving forward at all dealing with that grief? You know, when I came back to New York and like 50 reached out to me, 
he was like, you have to like continue his legacy, like all the different things that you guys spoke about when you were here about doing, like you have to make sure like his legacy lives on or else it's just like, you're being selfish. I remember how he phrased it, but basically he was saying that you're like being victimized by your depression of what happened. Like you gotta pick yourself together and like make sure you do this for him. Obviously the record is released and becomes a breakout yeah. success beyond anything you've ever been involved with. How bittersweet is that? That's the right word, it's bittersweet. It's like mixed emotions because it's like, he's not here to enjoy it. It's very, very mixed emotions. I have very mixed emotions about it. It's a fine line between honoring his legacy and creating something for his estate and his family and people feeling like it's exploitive. How do you sort of navigate that? I don't. This is all being driven by what he would have wanted. How are you thinking about Victor Victor and what is next for Victor Victor? I've always wanted to create a platform for like the youth to be able to get out like their creative visions and help them execute the things that they want to do. So I feel like I've always been given like opportunity. Like whether it was Junior giving me an opportunity, Pusha giving me an opportunity, Kanye giving me an opportunity, Lucian giving me an opportunity. I was able to take the things that I learned and the information that I've gathered and turn that into like a wealth of knowledge. What I always say, it's like, it's not about anything other than doing things that you love and being like true to that.